In the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean, a tale of tragedy and resilience unfolds. The sinking of the AHS Centaur stands as a stark reminder of the perils faced during war, as the vessel designed to heal and protect found itself at the mercy of relentless forces. Through the poignant accounts of survivors and the haunting remnants of a shattered past, we delve into the depths of this somber event, paying tribute to the lives lost and the indomitable spirit that endures within the legacy of the AHS Centaur sinking. In early 1923, the Ocean Steamship Company, a subsidiary of Alfred Holt's Blue Funnel Line, decided that a new vessel would be required to replace the aging Karen on the Western Australia to Singapore trade route the vessel had to be capable of simultaneously transporting passengers, cargo, and livestock. She also had to be capable of resting on mudflats out of the water as the tidal variance in ports at the northern end of Western Australia was as great as 26 feet or 8 meters. Scott's Shipbuilding and Engineering Company in Greenock was chosen to build Centaur. The keel was laid on the 16th of November 1923 and the ship was ready for collection by the 29th of August 1924. Constructed at a cost of 146,750 pounds sterling, Centaur was designed to carry 72 passengers and 450 cattle. Cargo was carried in four holds. The two decks within the hull were primarily for livestock and could also be used as extra cargo space. The hull of the ship was a turret deck design. Decks below the waterline were wider than those above water and a flat reinforced hull allowed the ship to rest on the bottom. Centaur was among the first civilian vessels to be equipped with a diesel engine. One of the most visible characteristics was the 35-foot or 11-meter smokestack. The extreme size was more a concession to tradition than of practical advantage on a diesel-powered vessel. Her engine was six-cylinder, four-stroke, single-cycle, single-action diesel engine. It had cylinders of 2,415 by 16 inches diameter by 513 by 16 inches stroke. The engine was built by Burmeister and Wayne Copenhagen, Denmark. One of her holds was fitted with refrigeration equipment. The refrigerant was brine and the insulation was cork. The refrigerated hold had a capacity of 3,000 cubic feet. In December 1939, Centaur underwent a minor refit in Hong Kong with a supercharger and a new propeller fitted to the engine. The supercharger broke down in April 1942 and could not be repaired because of equipment shortages and restricted dockyard access caused by World War II. With the commencement of hostilities between Japan and the British Empire, it became clear that the three hospital ships currently serving Australia, Manunda, Wanganella, and Orange, would not be able to operate in the shallow waters typical of maritime Southeast Asia, so a new hospital ship was required. Of the Australian Merchant Navy vessels able to operate in this region, none were suitable for conversion to a hospital ship, and a request to the British Ministry of Shipping placed Centaur at the disposal of the Australian military on the 4th of January, 1943. The conversion work began on the 9th of January, and Centaur was commissioned as an Australian hospital ship on the 1st of March. During her conversion, Centaur was painted with the markings of a hospital ship as detailed in Article 5 of the 10th Hague Convention of 1907, Adaptation to Maritime War of the Principles of the Geneva Convention. White hull with a green band interspersed by three red crosses on each flank of the hull, white superstructure, multiple large red crosses positioned so that the ship's status would be visible from both sea and air, and an identification number for Centaur 47 on her bows. At night, the markings were illuminated by a combination of internal and external lights. Data on the ship's markings and the layout of identifying structural features was provided to the International Committee of the Red Cross during the first week of February 1943, who passed this on to the Japanese on the 5th of February. This information was also circulated and promoted by the press and media. Centaur entered operation as a hospital ship on the 12th of March 1943. The early stages of Centaur's first voyage as a hospital ship were test and transport runs. The initial run from Melbourne to Sydney resulted in the master, chief engineer, and chief medical officer composing a long list of defects requiring attention. Following repairs, she conducted a test run, transporting wounded servicemen from Townsville to Brisbane to ensure that she was capable of fulfilling the role of a medical vessel. Centaur was then tasked with delivering medical personnel to Port Moresby, New Guinea, 
and returning to Brisbane with Australian and American wounded, along with a few wounded Japanese prisoners of war. Arriving in Sydney on the 8th of May 1943, Centaur was reprovisioned at Darling Harbour before departing for Cairns, Queensland on the 12th of May, 1943. From there, her destination was again New Guinea. On board at the time were 74 civilian crew, 53 Australian Army Medical Corps personnel, including 8 officers, 12 female nurses from the Australian Army Nursing Service, 192 soldiers from the 212th Field Ambulance, and one Torres Strait Ship pilot. Most of the female nurses had transferred from the hospital ship Orange, and the male army personnel assigned to the ship aboard were all medical staff. During the loading process, there was an incident when the ambulance drivers attached to the two twelfths attempted to bring their rifles and personal supplies of ammunition aboard. This was met with disapproval from Centaur's master and chief medical officer, and raised concerns amongst the crew and wharf laborers that Centaur would be transporting military supplies or commandos to New Guinea. The rifles were not allowed on board until Centaur's master received official reassurance that the ambulance drivers were allowed to carry weapons under the 10th Hague Convention, specifically Article 8, as they were used for the maintenance of order and the defense of the wounded. The remaining cargo was searched by the crew and laborers for other weapons and munitions. At approximately 4.10 a.m. on the 14th of May, 1943, while on her second run from Sydney to Port Moresby, Centaur was torpedoed by an unsighted submarine. The torpedo struck the portside oil fuel tank approximately 6.7 feet or 2 meters below the waterline, creating a hole 26 to 33 feet or 8 to 10 meters across, igniting the fuel and setting the ship on fire from the bridge aft. Many of those on board were immediately killed by concussion or perished in the inferno. Centaur quickly took on water through the impact site, rolled to port, then sank bow first, submerging completely in less than three minutes. The rapid sinking prevented the deployment of lifeboats, although two broke off from Centaur as she sank, along with several damaged life rafts. According to the position extrapolated by 2nd Officer Gordon Rippon from the 4 a.m. dead reckoning position, Centaur was attacked approximately 24 nautical miles east-northeast of Point Lookout, North Stradbroke Island, Queensland. Doubts were initially cast on the accuracy of both the calculated point of sinking and the dead reckoning position, but the 2009 discovery of the wreck found both to be correct, Centaur located within one nautical mile of Ripon's coordinates. Of the 332 people on board, 64 were rescued. Most of the crew and passengers were asleep at the time of attack and had little chance to escape. It was estimated that up to 200 people may have been alive at the time Centaur submerged. Several who made it off the ship later died from shrapnel wounds or burns. Others were unable to find support and drowned. The survivors spent 36 hours in the water, using barrels, wreckage, and the two damaged lifeboats for flotation. During this time, they drifted approximately 19.6 nautical miles northeast of Centaur's calculated point of sinking and spread out over an area of two nautical miles. The survivors saw at least four ships and several aircraft, but could not attract their attention. At the time of rescue, the survivors were in two large and three small groups with several more floating alone. Amongst those rescued were Sister Ellen Savage, the only surviving nurse from 12 aboard, Leslie Outridge, the only surviving doctor from 18 aboard, Gordon Rippon, second officer and most senior surviving crew member, and Richard Salt, the Torres straight ship pilot. In 1944, Ellen Savage was presented with the George Medal for providing medical care, boosting morale, and displaying courage during the wait for rescue. Seaman Matthew Morris remembers, I finished the 12 to 4 watch and I called the 4 to 8 watch to go down, including me mate and I was just having a cup of tea, and this big explosion, and the ship gave a shudder, and the skylight fell in on us, and I don't really know how I got out of the mess room, and I'd say there was a dozen steps up to the deck, and I really can't remember going up them, but then I was washed off the back of the ship, and then I realized I was in the water. Sister Ellen Savage was asleep in her bunk when the centaur collapsed around her. Merle Morton and myself were awakened by two terrific explosions and practically thrown out of bed. 
I registered mentally that it was a torpedo explosion. In that instant, the ship was in flames. We ran into Colonel Manson, our commanding officer in full dress, even to his cap and Mae West life jacket, who kindly said, That's right, girlies, jump for it now. The first words I spoke was to say, Will I have time to go back for my greatcoat, as we were only in our pajamas? He said no, and with that climbed the deck and jumped and I followed. The ship was commencing to go down. It all happened in three minutes. The suction of the sinking centaur dragged Sister Savage down into a whirlpool of moving metal and wood. Here her ribs, nose, and palate were broken, her eardrums perforated, and she sustained multiple bruising. Then she was propelled to the surface in the middle of an oil slick. Seaman Morris led them in vigorous singing of Roll Out the Barrel and Waltzing Matilda. Captain Salt, a Torres Strait pilot, despite his severe burns, kept assuring everyone that rescue must be on the way. Lieutenant Colonel Outridge and Sister Savage did what they could for the wounded. Sharks circled them and occasionally nosed the rafts. On the raft, Seaman Morris was crammed up next to the badly burned Private Walder. Morris recalls Walder's death. He died next to me and his burns just stuck on my arm. And I said to Sister Savage, who was practically opposite me, I said, I think this young chap's dead. And she said, are you sure? And I said, well, I'm pretty sure. As she felt over, she said, he's passed on. So I took his identification disc off him and his name was John Walder, New South Wales Army man. I gave his identification disc to Sister Savage and she said, will you answer the rosary? And I said, yes, I'll do my best. She said the rosary and I answered it and we buried him at sea. On the morning of the 15th of May, 1943, the American destroyer USS Mugford departed Brisbane to escort the 11,063-ton New Zealand freighter Sussex on the first stage of the latter's Trans-Tasman voyage. At 2 p.m., a lookout aboard Mugford reported an object on the horizon. Around the same time, a Royal Australian Air Force Avro Anson of No. 71 Squadron, flying ahead on anti-submarine watch, dived towards the object. The aircraft returned to the two ships and signaled that there were shipwreck survivors in the water requiring rescue. Mugford's commanding officer ordered Sussex to continue alone as Mugford collected the survivors. Marksmen were positioned around the ship to shoot sharks and sailors stood ready to dive in and assist the wounded. Mugford's medics inspected each person as they came aboard and provided necessary medical care. The American crew learned from the first group of survivors that they were from the hospital ship Centaur. At 2.14 p.m., Mugford made contact with the naval officer in charge in Brisbane and announced that the ship was recovering survivors from Centaur, the first that anyone in Australia had knowledge of the attack on the hospital ship. The rescue of the 64 survivors took an hour and 20 minutes, although Mugford remained in the area until dark, searching an area of approximately 7 by 14 nautical miles for more survivors. After darkness fell, Mugford returned to Brisbane, arriving shortly before midnight. Further searches of the waters off North Stradbroke Island were made by USS Helm during the night of the 15th of May until 6 p.m. on the 16th of May, and by HMS Lithgow and four motor torpedo boats from 16 to the 21st of May, neither search finding more survivors. At the time of the attack, none aboard Centaur witnessed what had attacked the ship. Due to the ship's position, the distance from shore and the depth, it was concluded that she was torpedoed by one of the Japanese submarines known to be operating off the Australian East Coast. Several survivors later claimed to have heard the attacking submarine moving on the surface while they were adrift, and the submarine was seen by the ship's cook, Francis Martin, who was floating alone on a hatch cover, out of sight from the main cluster of survivors. Martin described the submarine to naval intelligence following the survivors' return to land. His description matched the profile of a KD-7 type Kaidai class submarine of the Imperial Japanese Navy. At the time of the attack, three KD-7 Kaidai were operating off Australia's east coast, I-177 under the command of Hajime Nakagawa, I-178 under Hidejiro Utsuki, and I-180 under Toshio Kusaka. None of these submarines survived the war. I-177 was sunk by USS Samuel S. Miles on the 3rd of October, 1944, I-178 by USS Patterson on the 25th of August, 1943, and I-180 by USS Gilmore on the 26th of April, 1944. 
Kusaka and Nakagawa were transferred to other submarines before the loss of I-180 and I-177 respectively, but Utsuki and I-180 were sunk while returning from the patrol off the coast of Australia. In December 1943, following official protests, the Japanese government issued a statement formally denying responsibility for the sinking of Centaur. Records provided by the Japanese following the war also did not acknowledge responsibility. Although Centaur's sinking was a war crime, no one was tried for sinking the hospital ship. Investigations into the attack were conducted between 1944 and 1948, and included the interrogation of the commanders of the submarines operating in Australian waters at the time, their superiors, plus junior officers and crewmen from the submarines who had survived the war. Several of the investigators suspected that Nakagawa and I-177 were most likely responsible, but they were unable to establish this beyond reasonable doubt, and the Centaur case file was closed on the 14th of December 1948 without any charges laid. Historians were divided on which submarine was responsible. In Royal Australian Navy 1942-1945, published in 1968 as part of the series detailing the Australian official history of World War II, George Herman Gill concluded that either I-178 or I-180 was responsible. The former was more likely as she had served in Australian waters the longest of any Japanese submarine at the time, but had claimed no kills in the three-month period surrounding Centaur's sinking. In 1972, German military historian Jürgen Rover claimed in Chronology of the War at Sea that I-177 torpedoed Centaur, based on a Japanese report stating that I-177 had attacked a ship on the 14th of May 1943 in the area the hospital ship had sunk. Japanese Rear Admiral Kaneyoshi Sakamoto, who had shown Rover the report, stated that Nakagawa and I-177 were responsible for the attack on Centaur in his 1979 book, History of Submarine Warfare. As an official history of the Japanese Navy, Sakamoto's work was considered to be official admission of the attacking submarine's identity. Subsequently, most sources assumed as fact Nakagawa's and I-177's role in the loss of Centaur. Nakagawa, who died in 1991, refused to speak about the attack on Centaur following the war crimes investigation at the end of World War II, or even to defend himself or deny the claims made by Rower and Sakamoto. The media were notified of Centaur's sinking on the 17th of May, 1943, but were ordered not to release the news until it had been announced in the Southwest Pacific Area's General Headquarters Dispatch at midday on the 18th of May, and in Parliament by Prime Minister John Curtin that afternoon. News of the attack made front pages throughout the world, including the Times of London, the New York Times, and the Montreal Gazette. In some newspapers, the news took precedence over the Dambuster raids performed in Europe by No. 617 Squadron RAF. The initial public reaction to the attack on Centaur was one of outrage, significantly different from that displayed following the loss of Australian warships or merchant vessels. As a hospital ship, the attack was a breach of the 10th Hague Convention of 1907, and as such was a war crime. The sinking of Centaur drew strong reactions from both Prime Minister Curtin and General Douglas MacArthur. Curtin stated that the sinking was an entirely inexcusable act undertaken in violation of the convention to which Japan is a party and of all the principles of common humanity. MacArthur reflected the common Australian view when he stated that the sinking was an example of Japanese limitless savagery. Politicians urged the public to use their rage to fuel the war effort and Centaur became a symbol of Australia's determination to defeat what appeared to be a brutal and uncompromising enemy. The Australian government produced posters depicting the sinking, which called for Australians to avenge the nurses by working to produce material, purchasing war bonds, or enlisting in the armed forces. People also expressed their sympathy towards the crew, and there were several efforts to fund a new hospital ship. The councillors of Caulfield, Victoria organized a fund to replace the lost medical equipment, opening with a donation of £2,000. Those who worked on Centaur's conversion contributed money towards a replacement, 
and employees of Anset Airways pledged to donate an hour's pay towards the fitting out of such a replacement. With some people unable to believe that the Japanese would be so ruthless, rumors began to spread almost immediately after news of the attack was made public. The most common rumor was that Centaur had been carrying munitions or commandos at the time of her sinking, the Japanese being made aware of this before her departure. This stemmed from an incident involving the ambulance driver's weapons during loading in Sydney. The attack was universally condemned by Australian servicemen, who commonly believed that the attack on Centaur had been carried out deliberately and in full knowledge of her status. Similar reactions were expressed by other Allied personnel. United States Army Air Force's General George Kenney recalled having to talk a sergeant bombardier out of organizing a retaliatory bombing run on a Japanese hospital ship known to be in their area. Six days after the attack on Centaur, a request was made by the Australian Department of Defense that the identification markings and lights be removed from Australian hospital ship Manunda, weapons be installed, and that she begin to sail blacked out and under escort. The conversion was performed, although efforts by the Department of the Navy, the Admiralty, and authorities in New Zealand and the United States of America caused the completed conversion to be undone. The cost of the roundabout work came to 12,500 pounds and kept Manunda out of service for three months. On the 9th of June 1943, communications between the combined chiefs of staff on the subject of hospital ships contained a section referring to the Manunda incident as a response to the attack on Centaur, with the conclusion that the attack was the work of an irresponsible Japanese commander, and that it would be better to wait until further attacks had been made before considering the removal of hospital ship markings. When the consideration was made that the ambulance driver's weapons incident just before Centaur's voyage may have been partially responsible for the attack, it led to the tightening of rules regarding who was allowed to travel on a hospital ship. Quasi-medical staff, like repatriation teams, were no longer permitted on hospital ships. Ambulance drivers had to transfer from the regular army to the Australian Army Medical Corps before they were allowed aboard although they were still permitted to carry their unloaded weapons and ammunition. After consultation with the Australian Armed Forces, General MacArthur, the Admiralty, and the Australian government, an official protest was sent. This was received by the Japanese government on the 29th of May, 1943. At around the same time, the International Committee of the Red Cross sent a protest on behalf of the major Allied Red Cross organizations, to the Japanese Red Cross. On the 26th of December 1943, a response to the Australian protest arrived. It stated that the Japanese government had no information justifying the allegation made and therefore took no responsibility for what happened. The reply counter-protested that nine Japanese hospital ships had been attacked by the Allies, although these claims were directed against the United States, not Australia. Although several later exchanges were made, the lack of progress saw the British government inform the Australian Prime Minister on the 14th of November 1944 that no further communications would be made on the loss of Centaur. Torpedo attacks in Australian waters were common at this time with 27 Japanese submarines operating in Australian waters between June 1942 and December 1944. These submarines attacked almost 50 merchant vessels, 20 ships confirmed to be sunk as a result of a Japanese attack, plus 9 more unconfirmed. This was part of a concentrated effort to disrupt supply convoys from Australia to New Guinea. Several actions on Centaur's part may have contributed to her demise. Centaur was under orders to sail well out to sea until reaching the Great Barrier Reef, her course keeping her between 50 and 150 nautical miles from shore. Centaur's master, believing he had been given a route intended for a merchant vessel, set a course closer to land, but on the seaward side of 6,600 feet or 2,000 meters in depth. Also, Centaur was sailing completely illuminated, with the exception of the two bow floodlights, which had been switched off as they interfered with visibility from the bridge. There are three main theories as to why Centaur was attacked. The 
This theory stems from the rumors spreading after Centaur's sinking. If Centaur had been in breach of the Hague Convention of 1907, and someone had informed the Japanese of this, I-177 may have been under valid orders to attack. When Centaur left Sydney, her decks were packed with green uniformed men, and as field ambulance uniforms were only distinguishable from other army uniforms by badge insignia, and the coloration of the cloth band ringing the hat, a distant observer could have concluded that the hospital ship was transporting soldiers. Those witnessing the loading in Sydney would have seen the ambulance drivers bring their weapons aboard, and could have come to a similar conclusion. If a spy or informant had passed this information to the Japanese, I-177 could have been lying in wait. The main flaw in this theory is the question of how Nakagawa and his crew were able to predict that Centaur was taking an alternative route and how they were able to determine the new route selected. Similar but later rumors included that during her first voyage, Centaur had transported soldiers to New Guinea or Japanese prisoners of war back to Australia for interrogation and consequently had been marked as a legitimate target by the Japanese. Centaur had carried 10 prisoners of war on her return voyage from New Guinea, but as they were all wounded personnel, transporting them on a hospital ship was legal. This theory states that Nakagawa was unaware that the vessel he was attacking was a hospital ship, and that the sinking was an unfortunate accident. This view was supported by several Japanese officers, both before and after the revelation that Nakagawa was responsible. Amongst them was Lieutenant Commander Zenji Orita, who took command of I-177 after Nakagawa. Orita did not hear anything from the crew about having sunk a hospital ship, not even rumors, and believed that if I-177 had knowingly attacked Centaur, he would have learned this from the crew's gossip. When compared to the other contemporary Australian hospital ships, Centaur was the smallest, approximately a third of the size of Manunda or Wanganella. Centaur was also slightly shorter than I-177. The observation of Centaur was made through a periscope, and submarine officers attest that at 4,900 feet or 1,500 meters, the optimum range of attack for World War II era Japanese submarines, some officers would not be able to clearly identify a target ship's profile or hull markings. With Centaur's bow floodlights out, and with the observation of the target made through the periscope, there is a possibility Nakagawa would not have seen the hospital ship's markings if he had been in the wrong position. Apart from the two bow floodlights, Centaur was lit up brilliantly. To attack, I-177 would have had to approach from a beam of Centaur, which was illuminated by both its own lights and a full moon. This theory states that Nakagawa was fully aware that his target was a hospital ship and decided to sink her regardless, either on his own initiative or on a poor interpretation of his orders. Researchers speculate that as Nakagawa was approaching the end of his tour in Australian waters and had only sunk a single enemy vessel, the 8,742-ton freighter Limerick, he did not want to return with the disgrace of a single kill. Other claims include that Nakagawa may have been acting in vengeance for casualties inflicted by the Allies during the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, or may have expected praise for the sinking of an enemy naval vessel. In February 1944, while in command of I-37, Nakagawa ordered the machine gunning of survivors from three British merchant vessels torpedoed by his submarine, British Chivalry on the 22nd of February, Sutledge on the 24th of February, and Ascot on 29 February. His defense that he was acting under orders from Vice Admiral Shiro Takasu was not accepted, and he was sentenced to four years imprisonment at Sugamo Prison as a Class B war criminal. These incidents showed that Nakagawa was willing to ignore the laws of war. Following World War II, several searches of the waters around North Stradbroke and Morton Islands failed to reveal Centaur's location. It was believed that she had sunk off the edge of the continental shelf, 
to a depth at which the Royal Australian Navy did not have the capability to search for a vessel of Centaur's size. Some parties also believe that Ripon's calculated point of sinking was inaccurate, either intentionally or through error. Several points were incorrectly identified as the location where Centaur sank. The first was in the War Diary Situation Report entry for the hospital ship's sinking, which gives 27 degrees 17 S 154 degrees 05 E, 7 nautical miles east of Ripon's position. According to Milligan and Foley, this likely occurred because an estimated 50 nautical mile distance from Brisbane, included as a frame of reference, was interpreted literally. In 1974, two divers claimed to have found the ship approximately 40 nautical miles east of Brisbane, in 200 feet or 60 meters of water, but did not disclose its exact location. Attempts to relocate the site between 1974 and 1992 were unsuccessful, an associate of the divers claiming that the Navy destroyed the wreck shortly after its discovery. In April 2008, following the successful discovery of HMS Sydney, several parties began calling for a dedicated search for Centaur. By the end of 2008, the Australian federal and Queensland state governments had formed a joint committee and contributed $2 million each towards a search and tenders to supply equipment including the search vessel, side-scan sonar systems, and a remotely operated inspection submersible were opened in February 2009 and awarded during the year. The search, conducted from the Defense Maritime Services vessel Seahorse Spirit and overseen by shipwreck hunter David Mearns, commenced during the weekend of 12 the 13th of December 2009. The initial search area off Cape Morton covered 527 square miles or 1,365 square kilometers, the search team being given 35 days to locate and film the wreck before funding was exhausted. Six sonar targets with similar dimensions to Centaur were located between 15 and the 18th of December. As none of the contacts corresponded completely to the hospital ship, the search team opted to take advantage of favorable weather conditions and continue investigating the area before returning to each site and making a detailed inspection with a higher resolution sonar. On the afternoon of the 18th of December, the sonar towfish separated from the cable and was lost in 5,900 feet or 1,800 meters of water, forcing the use of the high resolution sonar to complete the area search. After inspecting the potential targets, Mearns and the search team announced on the 20th of December that they had found Centaur that morning. The wreck was found 30 nautical miles east of Morton Island, and less than one nautical mile from Ripon's coordinates, resting 6,755 feet or 2,059 meters below sea level in a steep-walled gully, 490 feet or 150 meters wide, and 300 feet or 90 meters deep. After returning to shore for Christmas and to install a remotely operated vehicle, ROV, aboard Seahorse Spirit, the search team commenced efforts to document the wreck, and the first photographs being taken by the ROV in the early morning of the 10th of January 2010, confirming that the wreck is Centaur. Conditions for documenting the hospital ship were not optimal on the first ROV dive, and three more dives were made during 11 and the 12th of January. During the four dives, over 24 hours of footage were collected, along with several photographs. Features identified during the operation include the Red Cross identification number, the hospital ship markings, and the ship's bell. The Centaur wreck site has been marked as a war grave and protected with a navigational exclusion zone under the Historic Shipwrecks Act 1976. A memorial plaque was laid on the foredeck of Centaur on the 12th of January 2010 during the fourth and final ROV dive on the hospital ship. This would normally be a breach of the Historic Shipwrecks Act, but a special dispensation permitted the maneuver, as placing the plaque on the seabed next to the ship would have seen it sink into the sediment. Following the ship's discovery, a national memorial service at St. John's Cathedral, Brisbane on the 2nd of March 2010 was attended by over 600 people, including Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. A second ceremony for 300 relatives of the hospital ship's personnel was held aboard HMAS Manura on the 24th of September. During the service, which occurred over the wreck site, wreaths were laid and the ashes of three survivors were scattered. This ship symbolizes the courage of Australian women in war and reminds us of all Australians who served in war and have no graves but the sea.
Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.